false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19.5 Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is another episode of our episode, uh, <laughs> our episode, yeah, <laughs> Hour of the Truth meets Inquisition Update. So I'm here again with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress, from the uh, United States of America over there, for another reading of the booklet that we have started some time ago, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. You maybe wonder why, when it is only some 68 pages thick, or 67 pages thick, why do we take that long? Well, that's because there is so much more to say than just reading this book. It implies so many other things. It has to do with futurism on the on the starting moment when you when you see ah futurism. Okay, what is there to say about? Well, futurism actually is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden when you take into account every little aspect of it. And that is why we have to take this long to read and discuss this book. Now, before I will start reading on the uh, on page 54 with the quote of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 17, let me first introduce you to my guest today, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the broadcast Hello. that also bears your name, and uh, I hope you're all right and feeling fine. Yes, I'm fine, and I'm blessed to be here, and I want to thank you for uh, hosting this for your listeners, and it's my pleasure and blessing to uh, to help out with that, and uh, uh, can't say enough about it. The truth uh, finally heard by God's people and exposing the great deception the great delusion called futurism and restoring true biblical Protestantism, that is the historicist understanding of Bible prophecy, that which was held by all the Christians prior to about 1800 AD. And uh, I'm very, very, very pleased and, and happy to be here. Thanks. Well, as happy as I am to have you here, that we can do this together the Holy Spirit leading us and telling the people who are out there looking for the truth to help them on the right path, I hope. Mm -hmm. It's not more that we can hope for, actually. But, uh, you know, when at, the end of my, when at the end of my ministry, I know I have saved even one soul. <laughs> that is already more, more reward than I can bear and that I can expect in this time mm -hmm. of day. And I guess that's the same with you. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm going to start on uh, in the middle of page 54, as I said, the quote from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, which deals, of course, with the pre-trip rapture theory, um, denying this pre-trip rapture theory, as you will see in our further discussion. The quote from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians comes as follows, quote, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also, also, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in, ri and dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Unquote. Now there is also another quote that speaks about we are changing in the wink of an eye or in the twink of an eye. What's the right word? The twink of an eye, right? Um, yes. The twink of an eye when Jesus arrives. Uh, some people, of course, want to take this part and uh, say, well, here you see, here's the rapture. But I think there's another point that we have to uh, maybe understand uh, in this second coming of Christ and the resurrection uh, of, the, uh, of the righteous and this changing in the twinkling of an eye. When we die, we close our eyes for the last time. And when we are resurrected by our Lord, we open our eyes again. Now, that is the same when, as when you go to sleep at night. You close your eyes at night, you fall asleep, and the next time you open them, a few hours have passed of which you have absolutely no recollection. You maybe dreamed, you maybe did not dream, but some time passed away that you have absolutely no recollection of. The only thing that you know is you closed your eyes for once. So when we are speaking here about this changing in the twinkle of an eye, that is actually the same for the dead. They die, they close their eyes, and the next time they open their eyes, Jesus is there. Just a thought, Tom, that went through my head the last days. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yes, well, we've discussed this in the past. This is the way the Bible teaches, that uh, there's, no, there's no life in the grave. There's no memory in the grave. There's no righteousness, no wickedness in the grave. It's simply the passage of time that is completely un that we are completely unaware of. So in reality, from our perspective, when we close our eyes at death, thousands of years might trans uh, uh, tra uh, yes. transpire, transpire while we are in the grave, but yet we're not aware of any of it. And, and, and it's simply from we wake to the last trump of God, the last trump when the dead in Christ are raised and we which are alive and remain, if we be alive at that time, are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so literally from a human perspective, uh, we, we close our eyes and we immediately open them again. So there's no, there's no awareness in the grave. There's no passage of time in the grave. And God does not leave us to slumber forever. And, but to us, it's no passage of time at all. And uh, this is what, and the, 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 this passage has been erroneously uh, taught that it represents what is commonly known as the rapture. Well, there's no such thing as the rapture. We're talking about the last trump of God. And uh, uh, the, the rapture was simply an extrapolation that was devised in order to entice people to cling to their false hope of, 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 uh, of, of the futurist hope. Okay, futurism preaches that the Antichrist is not the pope and that there before before the antichrist can be revealed there has to be 7 years of great tribulation but before that 7 years of great tribulation comes this so-called rapture and then all the believers both dead and alive are have a, a, a an escape from this so-called 7 years of great tribulation the fact of the matter is, those who are dead are going to be dead during the tribulation, and those who are alive during the time of the, this so-called tribulation are going to experience it. But it's no tribulation that's any different than the tribulation that the saints have suffered under the papacy for the last 1,800 years. Now, there is coming a great tribulation. There's no doubt about it in the end of time when Satan knows he has but a very short time. There's going to be persecution against God's people like there never was in the history of the world. And I believe that. And I know what the instigation of it is. The Pope is not going to be denied the fulfillment of his futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. Seven years. And, uh, and uh, But we know 
you and I, who and those like us who study the scriptures and understand that from Daniel's prophecy, we have the coming of Jesus. And that that seven period seven year period of time was his literal ministry from his baptism to his to his crucifixion, three and a half years, and then from his crucifixion to the spreading of the gospels among the Gentile world was another three and a half years. Yeah, because in Daniel nine, and that the uh, seven, it only speaks about that he confirms the covenant with many. These many are the right. Jews of that time that are yeah. not the Gentiles. Yeah. yeah. And so the gospel went to the Jews first, and then when they rejected uh, Christ and sought, obviously, to continue with their Temple Mount services, animal sacrifices, and one thing and another, then the gospel went to the Gentile world, to the truth that Jesus was the Lamb, and then Israel was destroyed. The city and the sanctuary were destroyed, just like it says in Daniel's prophecy. Like you mentioned last time we were on together, the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the historical record, record of the literal, the perfect, and the complete fulfillment by Jesus Christ, our Messiah, of Daniel's 70 weeks, of Daniel's 70th and final week. And with that reality, then we know Paul was preaching an antichrist that would soon come. But he could not come until the current reigning power was still in power. That was the Caesars of Rome. And when the Caesars of Rome were taken out of the way at the fall of the Roman Empire, what stood up in the Caesars' place was one who calls himself Caesar today, the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one Paul warned about. And Christians have been persecuted by the papacy ever since. And so we know what is coming in this so-called great tribulation that Rome has devised to deceive the whole world by knowing what she has done previously in the preceding 1,800 years of the church age, as they call it. Persecution of the saints, torture, imprisonment, uh, burning at the stake, all of these things. And uh, uh, we don't look for a future Antichrist. Bible-believing Christians have always known throughout the entire Christian era who the Antichrist is. It's the papacy. That's the, the uniform, the unanimous belief of the Protestant reformers and all true Bible-believing Christians prior to that time. And why, why did the papacy kill them? Because they pointed their finger directly at the papacy. That is the man of sin. That is the son of perdition. No matter what pope sat on the throne in Rome, he was the Antichrist of his day. Now, we've been taught in the futurist scheme of things that the Antichrist is just one single individual, not a dynasty of popes that have existed throughout the Christian era, but that the Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years. You see, they're going to have a redo of Dan. They're trying to conjure up a, a reenactment of the 70th week of Daniel. But instead of attributing to it to the coming of Messiah, which Daniel did, they're preaching the coming of the Antichrist during this seven-year period of time. He'll cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease when he breaks his seven-year covenant with the Jews. And uh, uh, so this is all being manually done by the papacy in cooperation with the kings of the earth over which he rules. The creation of the modern nation state of Israel as we know it in 1948 was not the movement of God. It was the movement of the papacy in conjunction with all the kings of the earth. The Jews have only one hope, the same hope that the Gentiles have, Jesus and him crucified, the one Daniel prophesied to come during the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. But the papacy doesn't want us to worship Jesus. The papacy wants us to worship him, and he styles himself the vicar of Christ or the replacement of Christ. 
And so now we have to have a redo of Daniel's 70th week in order to prepare the whole world to receive the false Christ from Rome. And in order to keep this futurist scheme, this futurist lie, let me just be honest about it, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, to keep it viable, to keep people believing in that which is virtually unbelievable if you read the Bible, to keep people clinging to that futurist lie, they attach this so-called rapture that guarantees, according to their teaching, that all the Christians will be raptured out before the man of sin, the son of perdition, arises. And so if, if they believe in the rapture, they're not going to disbelieve futurism. Okay, it's attached. I call it the icing on the cake. Yeah, it is. You know, cake, cake is pretty good, but you can take it or leave it unless you put frosting on it. Then it's irresistible. Well, that's what future is. That's what the rapture is. It's the frosting on the futurist cake. And if we can show the listeners from the Bible, from the authorized King James Bible, that Paul was not talking about a rapture. He was talking about the resurrection of the saints when Christ returns. And that there is no rapture then maybe people will spit up and dispose of futurism. Because the only reason they cling to this futurist deception is because it's iced with so much sweetness called the rapture. If you can spit out this beautiful tasting, this very sweet rapture doctrine, then you can come to the truth about the cake. It's a lie. Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, perfectly and completely. And not long after that fulfillment came the rise of the Antichrist, the papacy, who has literally taken his place in the world. That's why he calls himself the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God. And uh, the whole world wonders after him. Look, look, look how he's treated by our own government. And in, early in the founding of this country, there would no one in this country herald the coming of the Pope to speak to a joint session of Congress. <laughs> no. They would stone him off of our shores. To the early founders of the American colonies, he was the Antichrist of Scripture. But look at what it is today. Our government not only invites him, but they weep for him. John Boehner was a blubbering fool the whole time the Pope spoke at the joint session of Congress. It was all he could do to keep from weeping because his Messiah was there speaking right before his eyes. John Boehner's entire hope is in the papacy and in the papacy's control of our government. John Boehner was a Roman Catholic. He was not a Protestant. <clears throat> and, of course, if anybody in the, in the House or Senate chambers would have, re, would have hailed him as the Antichrist, which was always believed among Christians for 1,800 years, up until the, eight, uh, the early 19th century, why they would have been arrested and drawn out and uh, completely ruined for calling the papacy what Christians have always called it, Antichrist. Can I intervene here? Because yeah, you are making a very, very good point. And uh, I was uh, starting reading today volume two of History of the Inquisition. And um, that book from Philip von Limbach starts uh, in volume two with the dedication. And uh, on this one page, we read a sentence that is... That is my problem with that book a little bit. <laughs> he writes sentences where other people write one or two paragraphs. So sometimes in Old English, because this book was written in 1692, the sentences are really, really long. 
but I want you to listen because the, fast, the last 10 or 12 words, that's what it's all about. So just let me read this one sentence <laughs> from the dedication from Philip von Limborg in the book The History of the Inquisition. My design in it was to give a representation of that tribunal, not in false disguise, nor deformed by unnatural or hideous colors, but in living and genuine ones. I mean, to draw the picture of that horrible court which makes its principal boast of the title of sanctity to the life, not from the writings of those who separate from the Church of Rome, but that there may be no room for calumny for from those of the popish doctors and even inquisitors themselves, that hereby the vast power granted to the inquisitors, the most cruel laws of it, and the unjust method of procedure, quite different from the usage of all other courts, might appear to the whole world, and that hereby the papacy itself might be known to all mankind to what, uh, to what he really is." Unquote. And what is he? The Antichrist of the Bible. The man, the of, man sin, of sin. The son of perdition. The little horn of Daniel. Daniel saw his coming. Paul announced his soon coming. And John, the apostle, the revelator, confirmed it. There's your three witnesses. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. There's three witnesses. Daniel saw his rise to power as soon as the Caesars were taken out of the way. Paul, likewise. Daniel called him the, the, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, rather. And Paul called him the son of perdition. And John called him the Antichrist. It's the papacy. And look, this, this is not new. This is what I want to point out to your listeners. This belief system is not new. This is Christianity. True biblical Christianity has been believed for nearly 2,000 years by God's people. This is the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. This is what all Bible-believing Christians believed all throughout the ages. Yeah, I just made I, I just made this point, Tom, sorry to interrupt you here, but I just made this point because um, that when Limborch wrote this book, History of the Inquisition, he took uh, original records, mm -hmm. even from the Roman Catholic Church. He took uh, papers, even from the inquisitors themselves, to prove that. And by that, he says, and that is the, the epitome of a sentence, that by that the papacy might be known to all mankind for what he really is. I mean, by their fruits you will know them. When you read a book like That's The History right. of the Inquisition, you will understand that these fruits, the Inquisition and what it brought forth, this tree, let's say it, was planted by the Antichrist. It absolutely leaves no doubt, because the Inquisition is always linked to the Roman Catholic Church and no one else. So there is no other candidate of the Antichrist, when you read books like this, no. and when you study history, That's which right. is so important. Yeah, and in our corrupt history books, we're led to believe that this Inquisition, if it's ever even mentioned, was confined to Spain only. Yeah. All of Europe, all of Europe lived in fear of the Inquisitors. All of Europe lived in fear of the Papal Inquisitors. And they were stoned, they were burned at the stake, they were stretched at the rack, they were imprisoned in dark, deep dungeons and tortured, and get them to recant from their accusation that the papacy is the Antichrist. That's what it was all about. All of Europe trembled at the time uh, of the Inquisitions. It wasn't just Spain. That's ridiculous. We have record of the Spanish Inquisition, but there's record in every country of Roman Inquisition. Well, I tell you one thing, Tom, if we ever would have had access to the archives of the Vatican, that's also something that oh. I said today in a little comment on reading that book, uh, History of the Inquisition, if we had access to the archives of the Vatican, we would see thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of names written in a book 
of people who have been persecuted for their righteous belief in Jesus Christ, what measures of torture have been afflicted to them when they were put mm. into the Inquisition, when they were tortured, okay. and even when they died. It is all yeah. written down. Even It's not only Jesus who keeps the book, of course, but it is mm. even the papacy who keeps records of this. Yes, that's right. And um, uh, 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 the book that used to be mandatory reading in the in the in the true Christian churches all over the world was Fox's Book of Acts Martyrs. Acts and Monuments by John Fox. Acts and yeah. Monuments is how it was originally titled. Acts and Monuments, and uh, it became known as uh, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. But but it doesn't talk about just the Spanish Inquisition. No. It talks about the Inquisitions all throughout history, all throughout the Roman history, which hasn't ended yet. And it's through readings, acts, and monuments by John Fox, Fox's Book of Martyrs, as it's more commonly known, we realize that the modern-day assumption that the, the Inquisition was limited to Spain, to Spain is laughable on its face. And you begin to wonder then, why are we so indoctrinated to think that the Inquisitions were limited to Spain only? Well, because our government and our national uh, education system is headed up by our government. And it's our government that controls what information we get through our through the education system. They're the ones who select our history books. And they don't want this to be known. Because their their justification is that it would invite religious strife between the Protestants and the Catholics. Well, how would that hurt the United States? Well, we couldn't continue fighting side by side in papal proxy wars to conquer the rest of the world for the Pope's dominion. See, as long as Protestants are bereft of any true history, they cannot see what prophecy is unfolding before their very eyes because prophecy is just the foretelling of history. Now, for the first time in your life you ever heard true history then you would also understand prophecy. And then you would see, just as Yerk does and just as I do, <clears throat> that the martyrdom of the saints, the persecution of God's people, has been a, a main fixture of the whole Christian era. And, uh, and so then you might learn to discover who the persecutor was. It was the papacy. It still is the papacy, and it will be the papacy until Christ returns. And when you looked at the reruns of Pope Francis I, Antichrist Francis I, ministering to our government, you see for the first time with your own eyes that which Daniel prophesied, that which Paul forewarned, and that which John confirmed has now a prime place within our government. And now you know why they don't teach us history. Now you know why we're bereft of any knowledge of who the Antichrist is. The government has covered it up. So who does our government serve? Christ or Antichrist? It becomes obvious. I'd like to give you... And the rapture, the, the so-called rapture of the saints... The so-called rapture of the saints, which there is no such thing taught in the scripture, keeps us ignorant of questioning the futurist 
interpretation of Bible prophecy that is prevalent in all the churches in this country, whether they be Catholic or Protestant. And because of this, we're unaware of history. We're unaware of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy all throughout the Christian era. We're unaware that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. And uh, because we cling to this rapture deal, this rapture doctrine, this rapture lie, it's the rapture hoax. What Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians is the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the last trump. That's the resurrection of the righteous. It's the seventh trump, if I'm not mistaken, right? As I, as I recall, Because yes. seven is the perfect number of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything ends and starts anew with the seven, then. Yeah. As soon as this deception has completely run its course, if there are any to ever awaken to the truth, I'm afraid most of them will wait until the very end and will be convinced of the rapture and a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, and they are about to come to a very rude awakening because the next shoe to drop is the angry judgment of Almighty God. And when Christ returns, what will he find us doing? Eating, worshiping and him, drinking, yeah. and marrying, marrying and giving and into giving marriage. In marriage. Yeah, until the war starts and we're all blown away. God is coming for those who are faithful to him. And he's going to destroy wickedness from off the face of this earth. So who will we be found worshiping? Christ and the truth or the false Christ, the papacy? Will we accept Jesus as our Messiah that came during the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy? Or do we want a new fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel and a false Christ to fulfill it? That's what it boils down to. If you can read Daniel's 70-week prophecy and see the perfect and complete fulfillment of every element of that prophecy in Jesus Christ as recorded in the first four books of the New Testament, there's hope. But if you believe the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, you have literally denied that Jesus has come in the flesh, that Messiah has come in the flesh. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. So if you believe in a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, you believe in the spirit of Antichrist. And who's at the bottom and the top and the middle of the futurist lie? The papacy. The papacy used futurism all throughout history in the Roman Catholic Church to stifle the, the constant recurring accusation that the papacy is the Antichrist. So the papacy developed futurism to make people renounce that accusation. And now it's being taught in the Protestant churches. And it has been ever since 1800 A.D. or 1810, wherever you want to mark the beginning of it. And now it is considered the orthodox teaching of all Christian churches, whether they be Catholic or Protestant. The whole world is deceived. The whole world is looking for a false fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, a false future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And what lies at the end of that deception is that the whole world will finally capitulate and believe that the papacy is not the Antichrist, but that the papacy is the Christ. That's what this is all about. That's, there would be no need for futurism. There would be no need for the modern nation state of Israel. There would be no need for Jews living in the land. 
There would be no need for a new priesthood in Israel. There would be no need for a temple. There'd be no need for animal sacrifices if everybody believed that Jesus was the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. So who created the modern nation state of Israel? And who forced the Jews down there, out of Europe, to occupy that tiny little postage stamp piece of ground called Israel today? Who is it who really wants a temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem? Who is it that wants animal sacrifices and oblations to cease so that they can be suspended after three and a half years? It's the papacy and the governments of the world that serve him. And when they finish this hoax, the whole world would be prepared for a shocking reality. They have denied Christ. They have denied Daniel's 70th week as fulfilled perfectly and completely by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. They have denied that Jesus came in the flesh. So then not only they have believed. Yeah, so then not only the Jews, but also all the so called Christians. Gentiles. Gentiles. So called. Uh, yeah. They also are meant when Jesus said that I come in my father's name and you receive me not, and someone else will come in his own name and him you will receive. That does not That's only it. work for the Jews, that also works for all quote unquote Christians, for all you That's ecumenical right. evangelicals out there who have been deceived by charismatic and ecumenical movement to come back under the wings of Rome because she is the only true church of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You said a mouthful. Yeah, I got my moments. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's 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 just it's just amazing uh, this stuff. Um, I was I was thinking uh, about you saying that you in 2008 watched a lot of ET, uh, EWTN, um, this Eternal uh, Catholic Network, uh, during the visit of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth to the United States of America at that time. Uh, yes. And, uh, of course, because of that, you learned so much about the Roman Catholic Church that today, that today you can use in broadcasts like these to tell our listeners and viewers of the video. And there was one thing that you said um, that today shot back into my mind when I was reading History of the Inquisition. So allow me, please, that I will make a, a, another little excursion to that book. In chapter 2, on uh, page 172 in the book, in, in PDF, uh, we can read from Tertullian. And Tom, you will rightfully know what I'm talking about when I read the sentence. Tertullian, in his book Scapula, in chapter 2, wrote, Everyone hath a natural right and power to worship according to his persuasion. For no man's religion can be either hurtful or profitable to its neighbor. But the very important part of the sentence is, everyone hath a natural right and power to worship according to his persuasion. Now all that we are talking about here, goes, uh, everything is, is about worship. Satan wants mm -hmm. worship. The Pope mm -hmm. wants worship. But Tertullian says in this book, everyone hath a natural right and power to worship according to his persuasion. Now, Tom, what were they speaking of on EWTN in 2008? What did you hear this Aurelio, or what this guy's name is called? I cannot even pronounce his name right because I don't know him. What did you hear him say when he interviewed a bishop or someone who said in front of running cameras, what did that guy say, Tom? Okay, first of all, EWTN is just the acronym for Eternal Word Television Network. That's the official Roman Catholic channel on the satellite television system. EWTN is a 24-7, 365 Roman Catholic ministry. And during 2008, during Pope Benedict XVI's visit to the United States, they had wall-to-wall -wall live coverage. And they even at night replayed all the events of each day during the Pope's visit. And Raymond Arroyo sat on the set with a bishop of the uh, Roman Catholic Church who's, who's dead now. I think his name was Robert Newman. 
And, uh, of course, there's all this blasphemy taking place, talking about the so-called Holy Father, referring to the Pope and one thing and another. And uh, uh, Robert Newhouse said, I think I said Newman before, his name was Newhouse, R Richard Robert Newhouse was his correct name. And he said, no one has the right to choose his own religion. No man has the right to choose what he will believe. And, uh, of course, that got an acknowledgement from Raymond Arroyo, the host of the program, and that's how they ended the program. And what his inference is that only the Roman Catholic Church can tell you who to believe in, and only the Roman Catholic Church can tell you who to believe Okay. And that, of course, Tom, is important now, because then they also can provide the one you can believe in. That's right, the papacy, the quote-unquote Holy Father. Okay, that's Roman Catholicism. He's the vicar of Christ on earth. He is Christ in the flesh. And he dictates how we should believe. And that includes the Protestants, too. Rome claims jurisdiction over every man, woman, and child on the planet. And uh, it's inherent in everything that they teach. And in order for this world to become quote-unquote Christian, they must accept the papacy as the Christ's vicar on earth. That is the whole thrust of Roman Catholicism. That is the thrust of the Roman Catholic Church. And so... I watched EWTN as a matter of research for months and years. I watched EWTN and studied their religion and what they believe. Let me say something that might you, you might find startling. In one respect, I believe and agree with what so-called Bishop uh, Robert John Newhouse had to say. No one has the right to choose his own religion. No one has the right to choose what he will believe. The Jews didn't have the right, and when they, choose to bow, when they chose to bow down and worship images and idols, God sent them captive into Assyria and into Babylon. The Protestant reformers said, you don't have the right to believe what you want to believe. You don't have the right to choose your own religion. The Bible and the Bible alone is our faith and our law, and our practice, and our all in all. Jesus is the only Savior. There's no other salvation. Now, of course, man can exercise his free will and worship the Pope if he wants, but it won't end in heaven. He can be a slave to the papacy if he wants. He can be a slave of Buddha or whatever other so-called God there is in the world. But there's only one God. And besides him, there is none else. So, although Robert John Newhouse has had a different thrust than I do, I agree with what he says. No man has the right to choose his own religion, and no man has the right to choose what he will believe. We're bound by the Word of God. We are His creation. And we will all, those who live to do so, will worship Him in spirit and in truth. We won't worship Buddha in the name of God. We won't worship Muhammad in the name of God. We won't worship Allah in the name of God. We will worship Jesus according to His Word both in spirit and in truth. Those are the ones who will live forever. <clears throat> now, I'm not a dictator. God's not a dictator either. You can go your own way if that's what you choose. But then you have to pay the consequences too. Well, yes. Now, you can believe that the, the Antichrist comes in the future. Or you can believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, completely and perfectly 2,000 years ago. And that our Messiah has come in the flesh, just as Daniel prophesied, and we are his. 
and his alone. He is the only and the true king of kings and lord of lords. But who do the kings of the earth serve, according to the Bible? Not Christ, Antichrist, the papacy. And we see evidence of it on our televisions. We see it in the newspapers. We see it on the radio. We see it everywhere. And of course, it's couched as Christianity. It's nothing, it's nothing of the kind. It's the opposite. It's anti-Christianity. Our government is anti-Christ worshiping, Pope worshiping. And they are imposing upon us, not God's law, but Roman Catholic canon law through the civil laws of our land, both federal, state, county, and local, is Roman Catholic canon law. They all make us subservient to our federal government in Washington, D.C. Look, the states are all in an uproar now. If they don't kowtow to, to Washington's demands, they won't get any, any support from federal tax dollars. The states are going to go bankrupt. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if our treasure's in Washington, D.C., our states are going to do what Washington, D.C. dictates. And Washington, D.C. says you will impose Roman Catholic canon law. Of course, they don't say that publicly, but that's what they're doing. Or else you get no tax support from the federal government and your state will go bankrupt. And then we can do as we please with you. And that's what they intend to do. They're going to have their new world order. Come hook or crook, they're going to have their new world order. And we're going to go along with it or they're going to starve us to death. See, the Inquisitions never ended. They only got so big that we don't even recognize them as the Inquisition anymore. It has grown in so much strength, so much influence, and it's so out in the open that nobody recognizes what it is. It's like, it's like walking around the elephant in the room. You just have to deny that it exists. It's your only hope. But if you're true to yourself and you're true to history and true to the Word of God, that element in the center of the that elephant in the center of the room is the papacy. The Protestant reformers were right. All Christians that existed prior to the Protestant reformers were right. They all died with Jesus on their lips, cursing the papacy, antichrist, 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 and they all died, tortured. Their children were taken away from them. Their wives were taken away from them. Their animals, their livestock their land, and they were even denied burial. That's right. They threw their dead bones out in the ditch and let the dogs eat them. They were burned at the stake, racked on the rack, tortured by every means possible, the most diabolical, wicked torture, including waterboarding. That was created by the Roman Catholic Church. Waterboarding. It's called waterboarding, but you'll never find anybody willing to admit that our government waterboards people because that's what Rome has always done. Shove a rag, put you on your back, strap you down, put rags in your mouth, and then start pouring water in the rags until you drown. You can't spit out the rags. You can't spit out the water. All you can do is just breathe it into your lungs. That's the only thing you can do. That's waterboarding. That's been, that was one of the big inquisitor's tricks to get a phony confession, a phony recantation from those who they stretched, who they, per, uh, who they persecuted. Why did they persecute him in the first place? Because they insisted the papacy was the Antichrist. It's, it defines all of history. You're not to know about it. It's not taught in the schools. It's not taught in the churches anymore. So how would you possibly know about it? Because if you knew about it, you would go to stop what our government is doing, stop what the papacy is doing through our governments. And we could restore Jesus to his rightful throne and restore the papacy to perdition where he belongs. That's it. 
Back to you, York. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I'm going to pick it up now on the bottom of page 54 after having read the quote from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. From this and other scriptural passages, which we just read some half hour ago, <laughs> it is evident the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming again. When he descends, he comes to remain on the earth and remove out of his kingdom that which offends and works iniquity, as we can read in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. The angel Gabriel told Mary that her son Jesus shall be given the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, as we can read. Okay, stop. Yes, yeah, stop just a minute. The same angel Gabriel that told Mary that she would have a son and his name would be called Jesus is the very same Gabriel that told Daniel that Jesus would be the Messiah and precisely when he would come so that they could mark an X on the calendar. After 483 years, Messiah will come. After 69 weeks, Messiah would come. It's the same archangel that gave Daniel his prophecy, that gave Mary the revelation of the Messiah. What was Daniel's prophecy all about? The coming of Messiah. Gabriel told Daniel the exact, the precise timing of the coming of Daniel's Messiah. And he came exactly on time. And who was there but the same archangel Gabriel who told Mary she was going to have the Messiah? You see the connection between Daniel's prophecy and between the fulfillment as recorded in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41? There's no coincidence that it's the same Gabriel in Matthew chapter 13 as it was in Daniel's 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Or rather... Uh, yes, I've got the wrong yeah. reference here. I'm yeah, sorry. but that's all right. It's it's. It. But the but the four gospels the four gospels recount this. It's the same Gabriel. There's the connection. If you want to know that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, you got to see that it was Gabriel who who announced Messiah's first coming to to Daniel. And then it was also Gabriel who who addressed Mary, and gave her the good news. Yeah. There are millions of angels in heaven, and I think a lot of archangels, but why did God choose Gabriel for Daniel and for telling Mary? That is a little... He was there to see the fulfillment of what he prophesied yeah, I know, to I, Daniel. I know, I, I haven't finished yes. my sentence. <laughs> I wanted to mm -hmm. say this is a little detail that most people read over when they quote-unquote yes. study their Bible. Exactly. And this is so important information, you know, you you. Um, People often say, well, this and this is very interesting, you have to read that, but when you really understand that you have to read between the lines, that's with the Bible the same thing. You don't even have to read the Bible between the lines, you just have to read the Bible with the understanding that imputes that uh, that is imputed to you by the Holy Spirit. And that can only happen when you read the right Bible. You will only gain this understanding when you read the King James Bible of 1611 yeah. because only this one explains itself and only when you read this bible then you will understand and see these details and all of a sudden you will understand from thousands or millions or even billions of angels in heaven why did send the archangel gabriel two times especially in daniel 9 and in luke 1 well to make the point when i sent the same messenger Maybe it deals with the same person. Certainly. That's it. See, the trouble is, in the churches, we're never taught to associate the record of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with Daniel's prophecy. The connection is never made in the churches. Because they don't want you to believe the connection. They want you to believe that Daniel was prophesying something entirely different that wouldn't happen, that wouldn't be fulfilled until the very last seven years before Christ returns. Yet in the future, even in, in our age, they want to destroy the connection 
between the record, the historical record of the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, 2,000 years ago. But it's no coincidence. It's by direct design of God Almighty that he chose Gabriel to give Daniel the good news, and he chose the same Gabriel to give Mary confirmation. The good news, coming of Messiah. This is the 70th week of Daniel. At that time, they were approaching the end of the 383rd year. There was only seven years left to Daniel's prophecy, and Messiah was coming. And then it says in the Scripture that he was baptized by John at about 30 years of age. That began Messiah's seven-year ministry. Dan Gabriel was there when the prophecy was given to Daniel. He was there when the fulfillment was about to occur with Mary. And there is the proof, just one element of the mountain of proof in the New Testament, that it is a precise, complete, and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week prophecy. Not only to the year or month or day, but even to the minute. That's right. Never taught this in the churches. It's right in our faces. We read it all the time, but we never make the connection. Because we have false shepherds behind the pulpits. They want us to believe in a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. They want to promote to us the prospects of a future Christ denying the Lord that bought us. I know they preach Jesus. I'm no fool. I know who they preach. They preach the same Jesus to me that they preach to you. But when they teach you a future 70th week of Daniel, they contradict their preaching of Jesus. They say Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior, but they say the 70th week of Daniel's yet future. You cannot have it both ways. So you've got to ask yourself, who do they serve? All right, back to you, Yerk. Yeah. I burnt that one up, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the angel Gabriel told Mary that her son Jesus shall be given the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever in Luke 1, verses 31 through 33. This definitely sounds like he will be reigning here on the earth forever. Even Jesus taught his disciples to pray, quote, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, unquote, as we can read in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Paul the Apostle wrote words of comforting expectations to Titus when he said, quote, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, unquote, in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Now, when Paul wrote to the saints at Thessalonica, he was addressing one of their major concerns. That was the state of the righteous dead. He then assures the living saints that their Christian loved ones will not be forgotten by the Lord when he comes again. Their bodies will be resurrected as he stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 15 through 57. The Apostle Paul declares that when Jesus returns, he will bring the spirits of all the sleeping saints with him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15-17, through 17, which we just read a few a little time ago, he reassures the hope of the living saints by saying that, first, the resurrection of the living saints will not prevent, the old English word for precede, or take place before the resurrection of the sleeping saints. Second, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a very loud arrival announcement, a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. There will be nothing secret or quiet about his arrival. See also 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, uh, 7 through 8, Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. Where is the secret rapture mentioned in this verse, where family members will quietly disappear, without any notice? 
third. Then the bodies of the living saints at Jesus' coming shall be changed, as we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 54, into an incorruptible body, and they shall possess a glorified body like unto their Lord. Fourth, this latter group of living saints shall then be caught up, shall then be caught up, or removed from their present state of being to join the former group of sleeping saints. The Lord Jesus is not returning alone. Jude says in verse 14, quote, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. This vast company of saints is what comprises the clouds of 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. The living saints shall join his vast cloud of, wit of witnesses, as in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1 while meeting the Lord in the air. The writer of Hebrews clearly applies the cloud of witnesses to the people that he listed in chapter 11. In the air denotes the location of the state of elevated and spiritual union with the sleeping saints and with the Lord Jesus. This scriptural passage, which is used as the main stronghold of the rapturists, says absolutely nothing nothing about flying away to another planet called heaven. If there is a rapture, to any degree at all, the saints will only go up as far as the air extends. Air is the elastic and invisible mixture of several gases, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, etc., that surrounds the Earth. This is the atmosphere of space above the Earth's surface. How far up from the Earth's surface does the air extend? then that would be the extent of their distance of travel. It would be less than seven miles. The writer Jude also gives us the purpose for which the Lord returns. He says in verse 15, quote, To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that, they, uh, that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Unquote. The Bible teaches that there will be just one future, glorious, visible, physical and audible coming of our Lord. First, to execute judgment upon the ungodly, and second, to be glorified in his saints, as we can read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. The book continues on page 57 with um, the next part of this chapter called False Predictions. Well, we have been discussing in all previous broadcasts about these false predictions, because that's futurism actually summed up. Among right. all the hype that is generated as a result of the prophetic theory of futurism are false predictions and vain speculations. The false predictions concerning the time of the rapture is nothing new. Men who claimed they had special knowledge and insight into the future have mustered a devoted group of followers around themselves, have felt safe in making outlandish predictions. The predictions of the timing of the coming of Jesus to snatch away his bride have ranged from 1844 to present. Now, 1844 or 1843, whichever you like to take, is a very important date to the so-called Seventh-day Adventist Church, who call themselves the last church, the last righteous church before the coming of Jesus Christ. Came out of the Millerite movement, if I'm not mistaken, who wanted to predict the coming of Jesus Christ in 1844 because of the 2300 days of Daniel's prophecy in another chapter that we have not spoken about here. But there were always predictions of making, uh, of, of uh, saying when Jesus will return. And this in 1844, of course, did not happen because we are all still here. Right. So that is also another reason for my understanding why I do not very much like the Seventh-day Adventist as a church organization, because they are even built on false predictions, which we just read here. Yes. Now, the basis for many of the false predictions have been things such as 
the measurements between various points inside the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt, the religious, social, economic and political signs of the times, the word generation used by our Lord in Matthew 24, 34, the date of May, uh, of May 14, 1948, which was the establishment of the modern Zionist state of Israel, etc., etc. Now, in 1987, there was one brave rapture teacher that was bold enough to publicly proclaim the date of the rapture was as May 14, 1988. He based his predictions upon the 40th anniversary of the modern Zionist state, which he also rashly proclaimed as the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. There was a later prediction of September 1988. Needless to say, both predictions failed. Yeah, you know that, dear listener, because you are still here. Huh? To my knowledge, the latest date that has been predicted by one of the most publicly acclaimed prophecy experts is 2007 to 2012. At least he is smart enough to give a five-year window of escape. <laughs> Sometimes these yes, books I can re I are can re really funny, yeah, Tom, because ahead. you know this book was published in 2006, and so this last expert says the rapture will take place between 2007 and 2012. We are 2017 and still not here, so maybe the rapture will be cancelled because it is not scriptural yeah. at all. That's right. I can remember back in 1988, and I know precisely what is being made reference to here in this book. There was a man whose last name was Wisnant, W-I-S-N-A-N-T, Wisnant, who wrote a pamphlet that went viral in this country, a term that wasn't even used back then, but uh, everybody got a copy of this little pamphlet that he wrote. It wasn't much smaller than this little booklet that we're reading here. It was called 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1988. And it was read and discussed from many of the pulpits in this country. And, of course, everybody was preparing for the rapture of the church and the, and the coming, uh, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. When our Bible plainly says, says we will not know the day of the hour, Daniel was given the precise timing of his first coming. There's no such thing about his second coming. Okay? But yet Wisnant, in his book, 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1988, was gobbled up by the so-called Christian world, which believed in futurism, a future seven-year period of time. And this just lent credence uh, to the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy. Now, the historicists knew, uh, the, like they all, that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th uh, week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. And historicists all likewise know that you won't be able to place an, a, an X on the calendar when he comes the next time. He's going to come when the world is not expecting him. I come as a thief in the night. And after. That's right. And after the world has has bought the lie. Okay? That's when he'll come. That's when the witnesses will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And what pre, what succeeds that immediately? The destruction of all the wicked. Okay? It's going to be a secret. But it ain't going to be a rapture. It's going to be the resurrection and the judgment of Almighty God on the earth. And Wisnat was wrong. And he went to his grave in grief. And all those, including myself, who read his book were embarrassed to tears. Shame. Disheartened. But since then, God has opened my eyes and told me the truth. And not just me. It's the same truth that was believed all throughout the Christian era by those who God chose and who God called and who God witnessed the truth to their hearts. Those that had eyes to see and ears to hear. The historicists throughout history. And uh, now my eyes have been opened. My shame is behind me. 
and I've got nothing but Christ to look forward to, and the hope that revealing all of these false predictions and who authored them will become evident to people, and they too will be given the same grace that I received from the Lord, and that's my opening of my eyes and the opening of my ears so that I can hear and believe the truth. There's no futurism. It's all a hoax. And it's all destined to present to the world a false Christ. And that false Christ is the one Daniel predicted, Paul confirmed, and, and uh, Paul predicted, and John confirmed. And history records they were all three correct. The track record is set, and uh, there's no mistake this time. There will be no embarrassment. There will be no repentance. We have the truth. Historicism is the correct interpretation of Bible prophecies, and we're seeing before our very eyes how deceived the whole world is in hope of this false hope called futurism. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. On the bottom of page 57, the author continues, Vain speculations have also been a tragic result in the wake of futurism's captivating influence. For many years, futurist teachers have attempted to identify who the Antichrist would be. At one time, Mussolini was the likely candidate, but after the people strung him up by his heels, then Hitler was their choice. Some even thought it was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Some quote-unquote experts are for certain that the Antichrist must be a Jew, while others assure their supporters that he will be of Oriental descent. Yeah, you know, the Mahdi. <laughs> others are certain that the Antichrist will be a man of Western Europe in order to rule over the ten nations of the revived Roman Empire. All these false predictions and vain speculations are a direct result of twisting, distorting, and a direct result of even raping the sacred scriptures. Our modern-day Protestant evangelical church world has fallen in step with the schemes of the Jesuits' counter-reformation. Now, That's these right. two last sentences, Tom are so important that we could probably make one or two own broadcasts about, <laughs> about only these two. Well, there's no doubt about that. All the churches have been recruited wittingly and unwittingly into the Jesuits' counter-reformation. All the churches, no matter what name, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian, you name them, they're all now part of the Jesuit counter-reformation. How is that? They believe in futurism. They teach futurism. They deny that Jesus was the Christ, and they're, they're set on the very precipice of acknowledging the papacy. That's what the whole ecumenical movement is all about, and none of it would be possible. Not one whit of it would be possible had we maintained the Protestant teaching. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. He's the only candidate in the whole history of the world. We can be just as certain that the papacy is the Antichrist as we can be that Jesus was the Christ, the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. The papacy would be utterly destroyed if God's people would return to historicism, the correct interpretation of the prophecies. And yet the whole world has now become part of the Jesuit-led counter-reformation to destroy Protestantism. So what does that mean in literal, actual terms? That means anyone who calls himself today a Christian if he believes in futurism, if he's part of the ecumenical movement to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, they will be instrumental directly and indirectly 
in the persecution of the saints of Almighty God. That means the whole Christian world will be united uh, together against us, what few of us there be. And let me tell you something. You might sound, might think this sounds boastful. You might think this sounds boastful and proud and arrogant. But let me tell you this. These are perfect odds for our Savior. These are perfect odds for our Savior. The whole world is lining itself up against God's true saints. And God is prepared for the battle. And Yerk, you and I might even live long enough to see it. I might, but you might. I might not, but you might. You don't have to worry. You don't have to guess who the Antichrist is, who he has always been. Daniel was right. Paul was right. John was right. All believers throughout history were right. And today, almost the entire quote unquote Christian world is wrong. They're waiting for something that we have lived with for nearly 1,800 years, something we have died with for nearly 1,800 years. So what is the likelihood that they're going to come to the truth? They'd have to give up the rapture. They'd have to give up futurism. They'd have to understand the truth, and they'd have to live with their shame. Well, that's what I've done. I've given up the rapture. I've given up futurism. I know who the Antichrist is, and I'm shamed to tears. But God is the one who opened my eyes. So am I weeping? Not for me. My days of grief are over. For ourselves, we can only rejoice, Tom. That's right. And hope that through the my speech through Yerks <clears throat> and those few others like us that the world will respond because we're not unique we might be unique in our time but this was the predominant belief system of all Christians prior to about 1800 A.D. And we know who wins. We might die as martyrs. That's what God's people have always done. <clears throat> but we don't fear those who can, who can kill the body. We only fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So what is it if they come to destroy me and think they're doing God's service when they do? I just joined the rest of the martyrs of Jesus throughout the centuries. And those who die martyrs for Jesus wear a crown of righteousness. That's right. And what does the Bible say we do with those crowns? We throw them all back at Jesus' feet. It's for him that we suffered and died as witnesses of him, not the papacy. The world's witnesses today witness for the papacy. We witness against him and for Christ. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. It actually is uh, easy. You don't have to return to Protestantism or to even apostolic Christianity or whatever. Just return to the one credo the Protestants always did, shouted out, but never followed by the heart. Sola Scriptura. When yeah. you adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone, the only correct preserved Bible that we have in our time, the King James Bible, then everything will be so clear. You will understand everything. You will have no more questions. All questions will be answered. 
all questions that you have in life, all questions that you have about why is the world like it is, why is Israel there, why is there always war, why are we, uh, why, why are there people starving, why is there war in, in, in this country right now, where is that threat coming from, where does this economic um, uh, uh, economic crisis come from, or whatever, it all doesn't matter, it's all in the Bible, the Bible gives you the rest, that if somebody comes up with a sword to kill you, that you can say, okay, if I cannot convince you by the word of God not to do what you want to do, then do, because I know that I will be with my Savior when I wake up again, when he yeah. comes back. Yeah. Sola Scriptura. That's what it all comes down to. And if you want yeah. to watch my video that I made, Sola Scriptura, that was part of the reading of uh, History of the Inquisition. I uploaded that on my uh, YouTube channel, so you can look at that up, Sola Scriptura, and you will understand what I mean. Yeah. Well, Tom, I thank you very much for coming uh, to the broadcast today. But I think seeing the time that we have about 10 minutes left to fulfill an hour and a half, and seeing that the next part of this, um, of this uh, uh, chapter is called The Antichrist, I will not go in there, because I know that we will have a lot to discuss on that. And I would yes. really like to postpone that to, to another time. So can I leave you to some closing remarks to our listeners and viewers of the video, Tom? Yes, my regular closing salutation is a blessing. Blessing in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, our Messiah and the Lamb of God, the only and the true King of kings and Lord of lords, the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, Jesus Christ, Messiah. See you next time. Thank you very much, Tom, for being here. And for all my listeners and viewers, another time, the contact uh, dates that you need to contact Tom Fress, who for the moment is uh, very active also back on First Amendment Radio, reading and discussing the book, The Foundations Under Attack, which is uh, the quote-unquote second part of All Roads Lead to Rome that he read on First Amendment Radio in Inquisition Update in 2009, which he reads now, The Foundations Under Attack. You can contact Tom by sending him an email to tom at seawaves.us. Tom at seawaves.us, like the waves of the sea. And me you can reach via a personal message via YouTube or, of course, via the comment section of the video. So I hope until next time when we maybe will complete this little booklet. We have come to page 58 and we will continue next time in the 12th broadcast in the reading on discussion of the origin of futurism and preterism. Until next time, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye-bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're total loss.